Hello, everyone, and a warm welcome to today's edition of Patcast. Today is February 14th, 2023. And uh, it's, of course, a Valentine's Day today. So happy Valentine's Day to everybody. And to some of you, maybe it is already night. Uh, and uh, I'm Rifat Mandan in California, and I am joined by my colleague, Emilio Madrigal, who is in Boston. So today we are very delighted to have with us Dr. Kalyani Patel. She is Associate Professor of Pathology at Baylor College of Medicine, and she is also the Director of Pathology Informatics at Texas Children's Hospital. And today she is going to present a topic on pediatric pathology, and the title of her talk is going to be Biliary Atresia and Its Mimics. And as always, uh, you can post your questions or comments on Facebook or YouTube chat windows, and we will pass on to Dr. Patel at the end of the session. Over to you now, Dr. Patel, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Manan, who is also, who is not only a colleague, but also a, fr a friend. Um, it is a pleasure and honor to um, uh, present this topic today um, on this platform. So I'm going to stop my video and we'll get right into the topic. Um, as you know, the title is Biliary Atresia and its Mimics, and uh, uh, this is going to be a general overview for today's talk. To understand the entities that can mimic biliary atresia, I think the first step is to understand biliary atresia itself um, and how it can present at different stages followed uh, once we have a good understanding of BA, we will then move on to entities with clinical neonatal cholestasis that can mimic BA, followed by entities that have histologic distal biliary obstruction pattern on the biopsy, um, and especially neonatal biopsies um, that can mimic BA. We will then move on to entities that have extrahepatic abnormalities, that is abnormalities within the gallbladder or you know, in the extrahepatic tree that can mimic BA. We will then look at some diseases with liver explant findings that can mimic untreated BA or failed portoenterostomy, Kasai portoenterostomy, which is KP, um, followed by liver explant findings uh, in some diseases that can mimic treated BA with a successful Kasai portoenterostomy. So, so quite, a, quite a spectrum here. And as you can already see, a large number of diseases can mimic BA at various stages. So um, just heading into BA, it is an idiopathic or to date idiopathic progressive fibroinflammatory and obliterative disease of the extrahepatic biliary tract, including the gallbladder, manifests in the neonatal period and if left untreated, can develop to progressive cholestatic liver disease leading to micronodular biliary cirrhosis and even death by one to sometimes even up to three years of age. Um, typically, it is one to two years of age. Incidence really varies widely from one in 5,000 to one in 20,000, and is currently the most common cause of pediatric liver transplantation in the United States and possibly worldwide. Typically, um, as far as the neonatal presentation goes, it will be a healthy term baby with an uneventful pregnancy. The on onset of cholestasis is at or immediately after birth. Child is usually not very sick, and that actually can be um, uh, that can play against the early detection of BA. Yeah, um, scleral icterus um, and or jaundice are common um, presenting. Um, signs and symptoms, and clay-colored stools um, are often seen, but they could be intermittent. As far as laboratory findings, elevations of liver enzymes, which is um, aspartate and alanine trans, uh, transaminases, uh, are usually mild, and uh, the typical laboratory finding is conjugated hyperbilirubinemia with elevated GGT or gamma glutamyl transfer transferase. So this was a um, a study published in NEGM from our institution uh, in 2016, where um, uh, we showed that uh, if you do serially two tests, so we look at test one here, which is done in the newborn period at less than 60 hours of life, followed by a second test 
for again both are for direct or conjugated bilirubin bilirubinemia and this is in uh, within two to three weeks of life uh, around the well child visit and what we saw is that um, so the columns indicate biliary atresia present absent and the test in uh, the rows indicate positive or negative that is the test was positive meaning we had conjugated hyperbilirubinemia or not and so as you can see, when the test was um, uh, negative, none of these patients ended up being BA. And what you want from this test is very, very high sensitivity. You do not want this test to miss BA because early detection is important. And so as you can see, the sensitivity was very high. In terms of specificity, um, it was not as as good as sensitivity, but still, um, uh, uh, you know, very good. And what I mean by uh, specificity is that we had a total of here between the two tests, we had 11 patients where the test was positive, but they did not turn out to be BA. And that, that is what we are talking about, specificity. So the specificity was lower than the sensitivity, but the sensitivity was very high. And so this test were proposed to be a pretty good screening method for early detection of BA. This was followed by uh, the same group uh, published in JAMA in 2020, so about four or five years later. So that protocol was introduced not only in our organization, but also neighboring institutions to pediatricians. You know, it was uh, an attempt at more of a statewide implementation of this early screening of BA using uh, conjugated, you know, you know, very simple test for conjugated hyperbilirubinemia. And again, as you can see, sensitivity was very good. Specificity was good, not as good as sensitivity, but really good enough. And, you know, um, making this a very good test for newborn screening of BA. Uh, coming to imaging findings, you have triangular core sign, which basically shows thickening of the portal vein wall, which can be seen on ultrasound and uh, is considered uh, quite specific for BA. And um, other imaging modalities include a HIDA scan. So this is an intravenous injection of a radioactive material called hydroxyimmunodiacetic acid or HIDA. It is taken up by the liver and then excreted into the biliary tract. So you can see within zero to five minutes, you're starting to see the dye taken up by the liver and then subsequently, uh, you know, being excreted into the um, uh, biliary tree. And so when you see non-excretion of HIDA into the biliary tree, it does not automatically mean obstruction. It can also mean that the liver cells being either injured or sick or for any other reason just did not take up the dye because this is the liver cells have to take up this dye from the blood. This is an intravenous injection. And so we can have some false positives, obviously severe liver disease, neonatal hepatitis, small duct paucity syndromes, and alpha antitrypsin, TPN, um, you know, inadequate fasting. These are the instances where you can have a false positive HIDA, meaning you will have a, you know, non-draining into the um, extrahepatic tree that again, mimicking the egg. So to overcome the limitations of HIDA, we have another imaging modality called cholangiogram. What you do in the cholangiogram is you directly inject the dye into the gallbladder. And what you're looking for is drainage via the cystic duct into the common bile duct into the duodenum. And then typically the CBD here is clamped and you also look for the uh, excretion of this dye up into the common hepatic duct and into the liver and both tracts have to be highlighted to call this a normal IOC or intraoperative cholangiogram. Non-draining IOC is when you do not see the C, uh, you know, you do not see the dye going into the CBD, into the duodenum that is non-draining, typically seen in about 55% cases of BA. And then there are there is a small subset of BA where you will see drainage of dye into the duodenum, but you do not see dye going up from the common hepatic duct into the liver. And so more of a proximal obstruction seen in a smaller subset of BAs. Um, but essentially both of these patterns uh, would be would then be considered diagnostic for BA. And once you see this, the child then goes to um, uh, undergoes a procedure called cosipotoentrostomy. In terms of biopsy, there are really three 
classic features on biopsy. You want to see portal edema and mixed inflammation. So here is a portal tract with a portal vein. Um, you have an artery and a bile duct, and there is um, edema, diffuse edema into the portal tract with mixed inflammation, neutrophils, lymphocytes, some histiocytes. Uh, you will see bile plugs. Um, within the bile ducts of the liver, which are again classic for BA, and you will see significant ductular proliferation or um, uh, you know a presence of these smaller ducts, also called neoducts, neocholangioles, or cholangiolar proliferation. Many different names. Essentially, what it means is along the limiting plate of the portal tract, you are going to have proliferation of these small ducts or ductules, which are highlighted here by CK7. So exuberant ductular proliferation is also very characteristic for BA. Um, lobules or the parenchyma proper here in the hepatocytes, they're typically very bland or non-inflamed and they'll show cholestasis, both canalicular and lobular. Portal fibrous expansion is a pretty good feature of BA, but it depends on the age. And what I mean is, um, by that is early examples of BA, especially biopsies done at less than 30 days of age, especially those that they, that are done in less than 15 days of age can be very challenging. You may have some features of BA, but you may not have the full classic, you know, uh, pattern of BA, including fibrosis. As you can see, the fibrosis is pretty, um, you, you know, not well developed in this biopsy. As against a six, greater than 60 day biopsy, in a case of a BA, you're already seeing bridging some nodularity. So well established fibrosis in an older child. So fibrosis typically depends on the, um, on the age of the child. Um, what is a portoentrostomy? Photoentrostomy is where um, the extrahepatic biliary tract is surgically resected and a portion of the uh, jejunum is hooked up at the porta for the drainage of bile into the intestines directly. This was introduced in 1955 by a Japanese pediatric surgeon, Dr. Morio Kasai. Currently, the only potentially corrective procedure for BA. It, it's not a cure for BA, but what it does, it, it prolongs uh, native liver survival. And it is considered a bridge to transplant because um, eventually these patients will end up needing a transplant. The question is when. And the goal is to postpone that transplant and to, to give as much longer as possible native liver survival uh, to a child with BA using Kasai portoentrostomy. And so this is typically how the resection specimen um, from a Kasai portoentrostomy would look like. Plate indicates portal plate or a portion of hilum that is typically resected with the specimen. You have common hepatic duct. You have a little portion of a cystic duct. The gallbladder, as you can see, is very diminutive or hypoplastic with a you know very narrow lumen and then a very tiny portion of CBD here. And it is sampled methodically to document lesions at different segments of the extrahepatic tract. And typically under the microscope, we will see a fibroinflammatory occlusion of the extrahepatic bile duct. It's just different forms that, you know, these three microscopic pictures show um, findings that can range from near complete occlusion to some presence of biliary epithelial cells, um, but, but you know, without any normal, normal or patent human. This is an, uh, another example of an in-house case where you have a gallbladder and uh, showing how we sample these specimens. And as you can see, so we went from A10 to A18 here, different sections. In A10, you got 110 micron, really small bile duct um, uh, remnant here. And suddenly in A11, you have 2.4 millimeters luminal size. And this is how the epithelium looks over here. And you can go again, you know, A12, barely any lumen. Again, barely any lumen. You can see just some muscle here. And then again, um, very distally, you have, you know, like a very small diminuted lumen. And so it is important to highlight uh, methodically the location or localization of these lesions, um, you know, for the anatomic classification of the BA. And so just to sort of briefly summarize what we talked so far is, um, you know, you, the child is going to present at or immediately after birth in an untreated BA 
the child is going to have increased conjugated bilirubin with jaundice by three months. Typically, presentation, you know, presentation with jaundice is very obvious and clear. By six to nine months, if left untreated, the child is uh, slowly going to get into liver failure. And again, if left untreated, um, death without transplant in one, two, or sometimes up to three years. Now, without screening, typically Kasai porto entrostomy is done in 60 to 90 days. And there is a good amount of literature that shows that early Kasai helps with longer native liver survival. And so with 60 to 90 days of age Kasai, typically, um, you know, the native liver survival is not very ideal. Uh, uh, Again, with the caveat that native liver survival also depends on other factors um, other than just timing of Kasai. But the timing of Kasai is definitely important. Uh, and, and without screening, you know, you can expect uh, transplant happening at one, two, and sometimes some children will go up to, you know, um, three, four years of age. But with screening, the goal is to get Kasai in the early, goal is to do Kasai in the early period, definitely less than 60. I would say anywhere from 30 to 60 days, you know, 30 to 45 days is considered an early Kasai. And again, prolonged native liver survival with requirement of transplant, typically at much older. I mean, here in some studies, median age is eight years, but it can uh, go as high up to even adulthood. And uh, so the classification of VA has evolved over time. Early classification was based on embryonal or fetal um, pattern uh, or uh, and perinatal. So two types, embryonal or fetal and perinatal, uh, which was based on whether the finding, you know, the presentation was acquired lesions were uh, congenital or acquired, uh, and the acquired was considered a more common form uh, between the two. Then we uh, had the anatomic uh, classification of the extrahepatic biliary atresia. This is also called the Japanese or the Anglo-Saxon Saxon classification, which uh, typically is described as type 1, 2A, 2B, and 3, type 3 being or as you can see, all segments of the extrahepatic biliary tree are involved, also called complete BA, and is typically the most common. Both classifications have etiologic and prognostic limitations. And so more recently, um, um, this physician from UK, Dr. Davenport, has proposed a, uh, a four-tier uh, you know, categorization for BA based on isolated BA, syndromic BA, cystic BA, and CMB-associated BA. This field is still evolving and, um, you know, uh, we have we don't have consensus for each and every um, aspect of PA. Differences in post KP course we could see here as two examples. So let's look at a case where uh, we have a non-functioning or failed Kasai, and it is defined by persistence of elevated conjugated bilirubin because the expectation is that after a Kasai is done and the abnormal extrahepatic biliary tree is removed and the jejunum is hooked to the porta, one should have clearance of jaundice and normalization of conjugated bilirubin in three to six months of surgery. Once that happens, this is called a successful Kasai or a functioning Kasai. And we'll see two examples where KP was done at 60 days of age in both cases, but one patient here has a non-functioning or failed Kasai and the other has a functioning or successful Kasai. So this patient will have persistent elevated conjugated bilirubin, synthetic liver dysfunction, may even have TPN dependence, and um, in this case, ended up needing a transplant at seven months of age. We have KP done at 60 days, but because this is a successful Kasai, conjugated bilirubin is was normalized. There's no jaundice, normal liver function. Kids still went on to develop a portal hypertension, but needed transplant at 13 years of age. So significant difference in the post-Kasai course. Here's how the transplant would look like here. Because there is impaired uh, biliary clearance, you have a very green or cholestatic liver from externally, uh, quite nodular. Over here, you don't have particularly green or cholestatic liver um, for a successful Kasai patient, but you do have um, a large sort of 
nodules almost here is the big nodule in the right lobe and the left lobe actually looks more scarred or atrophic here on the external aspect. Here is where the uh, mucosa of the portoenterostomy is open and you can see some mucosal folds here. At 13 years of age, the mucosa is very smooth at the portoenterostomy site. Um, with barely any folds visible, but both portoenterostomy sites essentially look normal. Here is a cut surface, um, you know, essentially micronodular biliary cirrhosis on the left and on the right. You really don't have any cholestasis. You do have a nod, what what externally could be called nodular parenchyma, but on the cut surface, if you look closely, there are no broadband fibrosis. What you have is um, these big uh, uh, proliferation of hepatocytes forming nodules, but they are separated by very thin fibrous septa. Um, cholestasis microscopically in a failed cassai versus no cholestasis in a successful cassai and portal tracts will again show very classic features with bile plugs, ductular reaction, you know, portal inflammation, edema. There could be some patchy duct loss in these cases, whereas in a successful cassai, what you're seeing here is hepatoportal sclerosis. And what I mean by that is, at least in this tract, track, you have preserved bile ducts. There's hardly any ductular reaction, no bile plugs. You have some profiles of mildly hypertrophic trophic hepatic arteries, but a, a good patent open portal vein is not visible. And maybe likely this was a portal vein, I'm not sure. And But you know, a normal portal vein is not visible. And you, so you do have this portal venopathy uh, in the parenchyma. We have very uh, hilar fibrosis in a failed cassai, whereas, uh, you know, typically successful CASI patients show absolutely no peri perihilar fibrosis, um, and both patients will show peripheral fibrosis um, uh, to varying extent. Dilated hilar ducts with or without bile accumulation can be seen in both, um, and so doesn't necessarily differentiate. Uh, but over here, you can see uh, the amount of inflammation and fibroplasia is much more significant than over here in a successful CASI. Hilar portal vein also shows uh, very classic fibromyxoid intimal thickening and par partial or complete occlusion in both cases. Hilar hepatic arteries are normal. And so, um, you know, in a non-functioning or failed CASI, you will have severe cholestasis, biliary cirrhosis, obliterative portal venopathy with normal arteries, and typically the cause of portal hypertension is parenchymal fibrosis. As against in a functioning CASI, you will not have cholestasis. Typically, the fibrosis is variable. There is obliterative portal venopathy, and the cause of portal hypertension is not parenchymal fibrosis or cirrhosis, but it is OPV. And so we uh, published this study, um, uh, you know, of uh, biliary atresia patients with successful uh, portoenterostomy presenting with obliterative portal venopathy, proposing this hypothesis that the cause of portal hypertension in these patients is um, not cirrhosis. And so uh, explants of these patients should be evaluated carefully for these lesions. Um, here's another example where we have patients one, two, and three where age at KP, as you can see, was here eight days, followed by revision of KP at 3.5 weeks, 16 weeks, and eight weeks. So if you just make a guess based on the age of KP, um, this patient has had KP at 16 weeks, which is four months, which is, you know, per current standards, this would be called a late KP. And so you would expect that this patient to do poorly. But you can see age at LT here, this patient who had the earliest KP at eight days or three, you know, revised at 3.5 weeks, had the lowest native liver survival. And this patient with a very late KP had a similar native liver survival. This is age at LT similar native liver survival to the one who had at eight weeks. And what I'm trying to say is that, yes, age at KP is very important. Early KP is important, but that is not the sole determining factor for native liver survival. Um, and so we again published these findings um, uh, in, in some of our adult patients, um, showing how, uh, you know, it's the post-transplant recurrent uh, colon, uh, post-KP recurrent cholangitis, acute cholangitis that really, truly determines, you know, KP. So, 
to put it very very simply i think this is similar to you know when we say if we want to have a good productive day you have to get up early and then you got to do the things that you got to do right but then just getting up early is not is important but but not sufficient you still have to do the things that you want to do at the same time if you get up a little late but maybe you catch up on the things that you still want to do you could still have a productive day and so th that's kind of maybe the the simplistic logic that one could use here is where yes having an early kp is important um so you know um, you're not undermining the significance of early kp but at the same time you're acknowledging that that's you know not sufficient by itself and it is the post kp course that is um, you know, if the post KP course is complicated by recurrent acute cholangitis, that is going to take away the advantage of an early KP, and you may still end up requiring a transplant at a you know uh, younger age. Um, again, similar features from those same papers showing uh, you know obliterative portal venopathy uh, in patients with successful KP, and. Um, I would say we can just take here one slide to understand when you receive an explant of a biliary atresia patient, and you know, the both pediatric pathologist and adult pathologists can end up getting a transplant from a biliary atresia patients because if it is a failed KP, um, you know, the individual will receive a transplant in childhood. Versus if it is a real nice successful KP, you know, he, he or she can go up to adulthood and adult pathologist, GI pathologist could end up getting a transplant. And I think a sampling scheme, you know, might help in such cases. Um, you know, I think it, it is relevant to sample peripheral. So RLP basically indicates right lobe peripheral. So, you know, at least two sections from right lobe central, right lobe peripheral, same for the left lobe. We also sample generously the perihilar pH is the perihilar region and we also sample the hilum very generously because to document the venopathy lesions the obliterative portal venopathy lesions it is the connective tissue of the hilum that is going to show the branches of the portal vein and you know the extrahepatic portal vein and the arteries and so these sections are critical uh, for documentation of those lesions. So to summarize, you know, BA is a progressive fibroinflammatory ob obstruction of the extrahepatic biliary tract that involves uh, intrahepatic ducts in the late stages, uh, presence in the neonatal period with jaundice, a colic stools, co elevated conjugated bile, and elevated GGT. Diagnosis is typically multidisciplinary. Liver biopsy should show a triad of portal edema, mixed inflammation, ductular reaction, bile plugs, uh, and fibrosis depends on the age. Timely portoenterostomy is essential for a prolonged native liver survival. Post-KP course dominated by acute recurrent cholangitis uh, leads to early portoenterostomy failure. And those with successful uh, portoenterostomy show a non-cholestatic explant without biliary cirrhosis, but with obliterative portal venopathy. And so now that we have understood BA at different stages, let's move on to our first category, which is diseases presenting with neonatal cholestasis that can mimic BA. Now, this is um, a pretty long list of diseases. And so before that, let's understand what is neonatal cholestasis. So neonatal cholestasis here, I'm referring to conjugated or direct hyperbilirubinemia, where bilirubin is greater than 1 mg per deciliter when total is less than 5 or greater than 20% of total when the total is more than 5. Conjugated hyperbilirubinemia at any age in a newborn is pathological. And when we say physiologic jaundice of newborn, we typically are referring to indirect hyperbilirubinemia. So unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia, um, day 2 to day 5 usually resolves over time with or without supportive care. Uh, here is a quick preview of progress in neonatal cholestasis. So in 50s to 70s, we really just had these four categories, idiopathic neonatal hepatitis, BA, RH incompatibility, and sepsis. I mean, really, though, these were the pretty 
you know, kind of four categories in which um, the patients were classified um, uh, with neonatal cholestasis. Um, we started expanding those categories as we started identifying more and more diseases that can present with BA. But still from this German data, as you can see, 2009 to 2013, still a pretty significant number were BA you know, about like 41% in this study. As against, this is a Chinese study from the neonatal genome project in China. Now we got 411 neonates with conjugated hyperbilirubinemia. As you can see, the percent of BA is really very small, 8%. So significant difference between 41% over here to 8% here. And that is not because we are not diagnosing BA or the incidence of BA is going down. It is because we are just understanding other entities that mimic BA, we are understanding those entities better and better. And, um, you know, as you can see here, genetic percentages, you know, the genetic causes of neonatal cholestasis are basically just going to grow and grow. Uh, you know, idiopathic causes will gr grow and, and, and maybe not as much as the genetic causes and, and also with better understanding, they will generally reduce, but, you know, the true incidence of BA might might get into these you know 10% ranges in in current studies um again entities that uh, can mimic ba with neonatal conjugated hyperbilirubinemia sort of like these five categories that you can put them into genetic infections structural diseases immune mediated diseases and some others um really the the genetic entities are quite common in our practice CMV, one of the most common cause of infectious neonatal conjugated hyperbilirubinemia that can present with BA, colidocal cyst and Carolis disease, definitely under structural uh, gestational alloimmune liver disease can mimic BA, and, and I'm, I'm only putting it here because it can present with neonatal conjugated hyperbilirubinemia, but it really doesn't truly mimic BA in its entirety because, um, you know, uh, cirrhosis at, at, at birth is not how BA presents, and that is a typical finding, you know, advanced liver fibrosis or cirrhosis is a typical finding for GOLD. Um, and, uh, and among the other entities here, uh, children with total parenteral nutrition or prolonged TPN can really very closely mimic BA. So in, in the next few slides, we will look maybe look at some of these entities among the genetic causes. Um, you know, we'll focus on these and only because they are quite common. So a three-month-old baby boy presenting with jaundice, pruritus, diarrhea, and um, make a note here that the GGT is normal. So right off the bat, you know, that it's a little odd for BA because BA typically will present with elevated GGT. Ultrasound shows a gallbladder and a CBD is visualized and they appear normal. Again, odd for BA. This is not a sick child and basic infectious workup is negative. On the biopsy, we have mild portal inflammation, canalicular cholestasis, and occasional multinucleation of the hepatocytes. Uh, you have portal tracts that are that show preserved bile ducts. Uh, you do not have bile plugs, and the, the ductular reaction is not significant at all. Um, in those dilated canaliculi where we saw bile, electron microscopic examination shows coarse bilar bile. And so in the report, uh, the way we'll structure our report, will say mild portal inflammation with moderate lobular cholestasis. I typically say in my report, um, you know, no evidence of extrahepatic biliary obstruction because typically that is the reason why they are doing the biopsy. You know, it, it's rule out BA. And then, uh, you know, we mention about our abnormal findings and uh, we say no fibrosis. And why we do not call it by the disease name, because as such, coarse bile is a nonspecific finding and can be seen in, in other conditions like dehydration or biliary sludge, et cetera. And so I'm not just based on this finding, I'm not going to jump to the conclusion that this is a PFIC one, but in this particular patient, the gen genetic cholestate cholestasis panel did show a uh, homozygous frame shift mutation in the ATP8B1 gene characteristic of PFIC1. This patient underwent an explant at 11 er, uh, years of age. As you can see, there is really grossly no fibrosis or cholestasis grossly, but microscopically you have, you know, canalicular and hepatocellular cholestasis. You know, you have atrophy of the interlobular bile ducts, uh, meaning 
for the size of the portal tracks, the uh, caliber of the duct is pretty small, and some tracks even have no ducts. Uh, fibrosis can vary from region to region, um, and this is a progressive familial intrahepatic cholestasis type 1 or PFIC1 mutations in the ATP8B1 gene, um, you know, usually needs a, a transplant by, you know, adolescents. Uh, moving on to a second case with a two-month-old full-term baby girl, again, low GGT, so odd for BA, um, you know, um, and elevated conjugated bilirubin, so definitely mimics BA. Ultrasound is normal, and so, again, BA would not be top on the differential. Biopsy was planned, but bilirubin normalized in four weeks. And sometimes, you know, waiting just helps. Uh, uh, and then this child presented again at nine years of age with jaundice and pruritus. So this is the biopsy at nine years of age. Overall, we have maintained architecture. You have very bland lobular cholestasis. And as you can see, this is an immunohistochemical stain for BSEP, which is bile salt export pump. Here is the control. This is how one should see BACP expression in within in the canalical eye, and the biopsy shows no expression of BACP at all. And so, um, this particular patient did have um, a, a defect in the ABCB11 gene uh, that encodes for BACP characteristic of PFIC2 or you know progressive intrahepatic. Um, familial cholestasis, cholestasis type 2. Presentation typically depends on the specific mutation. Uh, this is an example, um, a, a different patient, example of a three-year-old girl who had advanced fibrosis. And we saw previously this patient, she went up to nine years of age, right? And without needing a transplant. Uh, but over here, we have an example of a three-year-old girl who showed advanced fibrosis. Um, and here we have one-year-old boy who is showing uh, chronic liver failure of, of, you know, what we called uh, uh, unknown etiology at that point. Uh, BSCP was negative. And this is an example to show all negative BSCP, ex all cases of negative BSCP expression are not PFIC2. And what I mean by that is um, uh, the genetic panel in this patient were, did not show any mutations in this gene. However, immunohistochemistry for FXR, which is the Farnesol X receptor uh, uh, protein, that was negative. And FXR controls the downstream expression of BACP. And so mutation in FXR uh, can affect the expression of BACP. So um, when you have an absent BACP and a normal cholestatic panel, always think of FXR deficiency. Uh, it regulates bile acid synthesis and transport and also regulates the expression of BACP. Um, here is another example where a retained expression of um, BACP does not necessarily rule out PFIC2. And, um, you know, so that's uh, also kind of quite intuitive because one would think, you know, if the protein is present, how can we, you know, call it PFIC2? And that's because it's, it's only the epitope that is identified by this antibody is detected, but it's the abnormalities in other epitopes that can affect the function of the protein or sometimes it is the post-translation modifications that affect the function of the protein, uh, but leaves the uh, epitope identified by the antibody clone intact. And so we could have those examples as well. Um, here is a third example of a case of a two-month-old term boy presenting with scleral icterus, dark yellow urine, intermittently cis birth, uh, has elevated conjugated bilirubin and high GGT. So with high GGT and elevated Sibyl, you know, you're definitely going to think of BA. But ultrasound examination was normal, infectious workup is negative, and we have a biopsy done at three months of age. You have cholestasis within the liver, and, you know, this was called mild cholestasis of unknown etiology. There was no fibrosis at three months, and so essentially that, in you know, really rules out BA or makes BA very less likely. Jaundice was relieved by uh, ursodeoxycholic acid management, and the child presented again at one year of age, another biopsy at outside facility. Now you can see uh, the fibrosis is more advanced than we, what we saw previously. We are starting to see ductular reaction. 
um, there is copper accumulation within the tissue. And so this was called mild to moderate cholestasis, focally advanced fibrosis, overall stage three, and again, progressive cholestatic liver disease of unknown etiology. This patient was referred to our hospital for a workup, was clinically stable with intermittent pruritus, was lost to follow up, and then presented again at six years of age with synthetic liver dysfunction and ascites, and again underwent a biopsy. Now you can see there's even more portal fibrous expansion, there's pile plugs, there's ductular reaction, mixed inflammation and edema, and really truly mimics BA very closely at this point, you know. Multiple constricted ducts are seen in the portal tracts. You got, you know, bile extravasation, periportal bile granulomas, uh, hepatocytes can be almost normal. You have preserved BACP expression along the canalicular membranes, but what you have is complete loss of MDR3 protein expression along the canaliculi. This is a normal control. And so loss of MDR3 really, um, you know, hinges the diagnosis for PFIC3, uh, which, um, uh, uh, you know, happens because of the gene defect in ABCB4 transporter of phospholipids across the canalicular membrane. So this patient underwent an explant at eight years of age. This is how the explant looks like. In the larger tracts, as you can see, there's hardly any pathology. You have the portal veins, the hepatic arteries, the bile ducts that really look very normal. But when you come to the smaller interlobular portal tracts, you know, they are often devoid of ducts. They will show bile plugs, ductular reaction, lobules will show cholestasis. And so it is PFIC3 that mimics BA the most closely among the three entities between PFIC1, 2, and 3. It is PFIC3 that mimics BA the most. Uh, PFIC1 is a disease of lobules and portal tracts, PFIC2 mainly a lobular disease, and PFIC3 mainly a portal disease that mimics BA. We also have advances in uh, PFICs with PFIC4, 5, and then also a PFIC that is associated with myopi B defects. Um, you know, in the interest of time, I don't think we can go into all of these details, but feel free to, um, you know, review this beautiful article on various types of PFIC um, and their characteristics. We will now move on to some other entities that can present with neonatal uh, conjugated hyperbilirubinemia. So we have a two weeks old full term male with possible dysmorphic face. Uh, I'm sorry, two weeks old possible dysmorphic face. Face. Uh, there is conjugated hyperbilirubinemia. Uh, GGT is also elevated, and HIDA shows a good tracer uptake by the liver but no clearance from the liver into the gallbladder or, or the duodenum. And ultrasound shows a small gallbladder. Now, really, a lot of things, um, you know, are mimicking BA. You know, early presentation, elevated conjugated bile, elevated GGT, everything pretty much, you know, can be seen in BA. What you have on the biopsy here are, uh, here is a portal tract with a bile duct. Here's a hepatic artery, another artery, and a vein. And there is very mild inflammation here in this portal tract, if you can even call it an inflammation. But otherwise, you don't have the classic triad. Again, coming back to this triad of BA, where portal edema, mixed inflammation, ductular reaction, and bile plugs, we do not have any of that on the biopsy. Um, and the lobules are showing some cholestasis um, for um, and, and again, some duct loss can be seen with prematurity or peripheral sampling. This is a term child, uh, two weeks old. And so, you know, we are not uh, worrying about that. But this was a case of a, um, a patient with allergial syndrome who had syndromic paucity um, of bile ducts. Uh, the normal bile duct to portal tract ratio in full term infants is 0.9 to 1.8. And duct paucity is defined as when you have absent bile ducts in more than 50% of the total portal tract. So where the BD to PT ratio should be less than 0.5, provided you have adequate number of portal tracts to look at. And by adequate, we typically like to see, I, I have said here eight to 10, um, but sometimes we will get six. So, you know, ideally eight to 10, uh, definitely not less than six. Um, 
And so we have a, a laundry list of uh, entities that can cause uh, uh, non-syndromic uh, paucity of bile ducts, typically infections, immune abnormalities, GVHD is a great or you know well-known example. Uh, chronic rejection is another well-known example to cause immune-mediated loss of bile ducts. You got some drugs, inherited metabolic diseases, chromosomal defects. Um, you can have isolated idiopathic ductopenia, and it could be a late feature in some diseases like BA, sclerosing cholangitis, LCH, and PPC. So for this one on the PATH report, we said moderate hepatocanalicular cholestasis. There's no significant fibrosis. There's no evidence of BA. We are going to do BCEP and MDR3. They were preserved in this biopsy. And while this biopsy was being worked up, a um, cardiac echocardiogram showed left pulmonary artery stenosis and a chest X-ray showed butterfly vertebrae. So once you have these findings, now you're really going to think um, closely about allergial syndrome, which is arteriohepatic dysplasia, which was the pre you know, previous name for this disease. We have two types, ALGS1 and ALGS2. One is uh, much more common um, and is, uh, happens due to mutations in the JAG1 gene on chromosome 20. For type 2, the NOTCH2 gene on chromosome 1P is responsible. And what we have as a pathology is progressive intrahepatic loss of bile ducts. Ductular reaction may or may not be present. Cholestasis is usually mild. And extrahepatic abnormalities may or may not accompany uh, patients, uh, you know, with allergy syndrome. This is a good article published in PDP where they talk about how presence of ductular reaction in an early biopsy. So this was a wedge biopsy at six months age. Um, presence of ductular reaction confused the management, and this patient was originally thought of as BA. But then a subsequent biopsy at 25 months of age um, shows absolutely no ducts or ductular reaction. And it just took some time to establish the diagnosis of allergies on this biopsy. Uh, here is just a spectrum of pathologic findings in allergial. And I have intentionally, as you can see, included biopsies of a slightly older children. I mean, they're not very old, but not neonates is what I'm trying to say. So 3.5 years, two years, you know, explanted two years. Here is a four years. And all I'm trying to show is that even at, you know, at, at this apparently, you know, higher age, there's barely any, you know, the fibrosis is not advanced. And that is the point here is typically Transplantation in allergy is not done for cirrhosis. It is actually typically done for intractable pruritus. Um, progression to cirrhosis is rare in this disease and mortality is related to cardiac abnormalities and intra intracranial bleeding due to other vascular um, you know, uh, lesions such as aneurysms. So with this, we will now look at some of the entities that can show histologic distal biliary obstruction pattern uh, on a liver biopsy. And what I mean by that is distal biliary obstruction pattern. Also, some people will refer uh, to this as large duct obstruction, also called distal obstructive cholangiopathy, you know, just different names. But what we are looking for uh, is that trial that we talked about for BA, where we have portal edema, mixed inflammation, bile plugs, ductular reaction, bland or posse inflammatory, lobular cholestasis, and fibrosis in long-standing cases. So when you have all this on a biopsy, at that point, these are the disease entities that should be kept in mind where P53, as we talked about, how this mimics VA very closely being a portal-based disease, neonatal sclerosing cholangitis, subset of patients with CMV, TPN can very closely mimic BA in terms of having these features on the biopsy, alpha antitrypsin deficiency, a subset of young patients with allergial syndrome, a subset of patients with cystic fibrosis, and rarely structural lesions such as colloidal cyst. So all of these patients should be, all of these disease entities should be entertained in the differential when you have a biopsy that shows a distal obstruct, you know, biliary obstructive pattern in the right 
age, you know, so sort of in a neonatal period in the right context. Um, and so let's look at at least some of them, because again, it is a, a long list and we'll look at the more common ones. So for allergial syndrome, you know, if you look through literature, there are multiple reports of allergial patients who have undergone cacipotoentrostomy. And, you know, you would wonder like, you know, how come? Um, is it a wrong diagnosis? And that's why, I mean, are they called BA in the beginning and that's why they undergo photoentrostomy? Or is it allergy with extrahepatic abnormalities? And so let's look at this. We saw this picture of, you know, BA, the extrahepatic biliary remnant of the BA with this uh, very diminutive or atritic, you know, uh, biliary tract. And so this is a 12-year-old uh, male with allergy syndrome. And as you can see, there is complete absence of extrahepatic biliary structures. The gallbladder fossa had a somewhat thickened connective tissue, but really there was no identifiable gallbladder um, anywhere over here. And even in the hilar region, as you can see, so here is the liver parenchyma, here's the uh, vessels, you got some thick nerves, but there is no bile duct. So in the hilar region, there's complete absence of bile ducts. And what we had is at the uh, section of the common hepatic duct, we had this one very single diminuted profile of a bile duct that measured 240 microns. And so one would say, well, all of these extrahepatic findings, you know, these truly mimic BA so closely. And so this is a beautiful radiologic study done in 2017, where they looked at seven patients with allergial 48 patients with biliary atresia, and they looked at a bunch of radiologic features and saw which of the features that are otherwise typically considered for BA or considered classic for BA were also seen in allergials. And as you can see, small gallbladder was seen quite frequently in allergials. Gallbladder wall irregularity was also seen here. And by MRCP and uh, IOC, which is intraoperative angiogram, you can see um, a whole host of abnormalities were seen in a good number of allergy patients, you know, non-visualized confluence level. 100% of allergy patients showed this. Non-visualized common hepatic duct, you know, two-thirds two of allergy showed this. Um, and so it, it just nicely illustrates how extrahepatic abnormalities that we often consider to be specific for BA are not really specific for BA, you know, and there is no genotype phenotype correlation today. JAG1 mutations have been reported in patients with BA. And so the question is, you know, just because a JAG1 mutation is present, should you call that patient uh, allergial, right? You know, so, and so clinical criteria for diagnosis of allergial are evolving and there is a, a whole body of literature uh, on that. Here is a, a nice uh, descriptive um, paper showing how extrahepatic abnormalities in patients with cystic BA, um, uh, I'm sorry, in patients with cystic fibrosis um, can mimic BA. So we had four infants with cystic fibrosis who underwent Kasai portoentrostomy. Uh, and and uh, these are the findings from their biliary remnants. And as you can see, uh, and this paper really illustrates it very nicely that they do mimic BA, but the mimicry is sort of imperfect. And wh what we mean by imperfect is that you have these dilated structures with mucin accumulation in them, uh, findings that we typically, uh, you know, consider um, um, or, or, you know, that typically known to occur in cystic fibrosis, um, those were seen in these extrahepatic biliary remnants of these patients. Um, but having said that, you know, as you can imagine, the uh, imaging abnormalities and the biopsy findings mimicked BA so closely that these children underwent, uh, uh, you know, photoentrostomy. Uh, so now coming on to... Um, a disease entities uh, that can mimic BA on a liver explant. So let's say you have a liver explant of a patient where um, you are told, you know, uh, cirrhosis of unknown etiology, basically. So at that point, you know, th this is the cut surface of the liver of a patient with untreated BA or failed Kasai photoentrostomy. And so when photoentrostomy fails or 
and by untreated, what I mean is the patient just never underwent a portoendrostomy. So you're going to have micronodular biliary cirrhosis on the cut surface, and you're going to have these very dilated bile duct profiles within the parenchyma, often called as by lakes within the liver. And so microscopically, this is how it's going to look like. And in advanced cases of BA, you will even have portal tracts that are completely devoid of bile duct. So intraparenchymal duct loss is a well-known finding in advanced BA. And so these are the disease entities that can mimic uh, where the liver explant can mimic an untreated BA or a failed KP. Um, you know, we have PFIC all types, prolonged TPN, severe cases of alpha antitrypsin deficiency, neonatal sclerosing cholangitis, bile acid synthesis defects, and ALGS patients undergoing who have undergone photoendrostomy um, in the neonatal period. Uh, let us now, this is going to be the last sort of subsection of the talk where we are going to look at diseases with liver explant findings mimicking treated BA with a successful KP. So we already saw where BA patients who have a successful KP, particularly those without significant recurrent acute cholangitis show liver explant findings of nodular regenerative hyperplasia and obliterative portal venopathy. They do not have the typical cholestasis in their explant. They do not have the typical you know, micronodular biliary cirrhosis in their explant, no bile lakes, whatnot. So these are typically adolescents or young adults. And at this age, um, you know, the diseases that can mimic treated BA explants are non serotic portal hypertension, primary immune dysregulation disorders that can present with NRH, some, and by NRH we mean nodular regenerative hypertasia, some connective tissue disorders that can manifest with NRH, drug-related NRH and other syndromic disorders manifesting with NRH. And so here is one example. This is an explanted liver in a 13-year-old girl who had NRH and OPV, which is obliterative portal venopathy, due to an immune dysregulation disorder. See how the cut surface of the liver looks very nodular, but not cholestatic. And then even though there are nodules, there is not much broad fibrosis. Um, so here is a trichrome. There's barely any fibrosis. And the nodules are basically formed by hypertrophic and atrophic um, hepatic cords, uh, which you know, is a classic finding for NRH. And in between two hypertrophic nodules, you have this compressed or atrophic parenchyma, uh, which gives the capsular bumpy contour or the irregular capsular contour, which often on ultrasound can look like cirrhosis. In the portal tracts, you have, this is a great example of portal vein herniation. You have hepatic artery, bile duct, sclerosis of the portal stroma. And another example of a portal tract where you have a bile duct, you got hepatic artery, but no portal vein. So this is called complete portal vein stenosis. And this would be portal vein herniation, basically explant findings that mimic treated uh, BA. Um, it, as, as sort of this last portion of this talk, we will quickly look at the advances in genetic cholestasis panels. Um, and this is a great paper. I think this is from Thailand. Yeah, Thailand with a 20K series from Thailand where they did a whole exome um, uh, sequencing study on patients with BA showing even though they were called BA, they do have mutations in these common genes. And so, you know, arguing whether it is the disease per se causing a BA-like phenotype, or do you really have both, you know? Um, and so as the understanding of the lesions that were originally thought to be specific to BA is evolving, we are realizing that severe inflammatory cholangiopathy of BA may not be a distinct disease entity, but a shared pathology among several infantile cholestasis syndromes, meaning a whole host of these disease entities can have a pathology that can, what we would otherwise say, look like BA. And so, you know, have this shared pathology like BA. And um, again, just 
you know, more studies need to be done on BA patients um, for better understanding. Um, if you are interested, this lecture essentially is based on a recent, uh, I guess it's a mini symposium slash review um, that I wrote for diagnostic histopathology. So if you are more of a reader than a listener, then feel free to uh, review this article. Essentially talks about the same things that I you know, showed on this presentation uh, and even possibly in maybe in, in some you know, greater details. Um, and that's it. Here's you know, all of my coworkers without whom it's impossible to um, have a, a, a thriving um, you know, clinical and academic uh, practice. Um, our physician assistant, uh, Yen, who I'm truly grateful to, who does an extremely thorough medical sampling of all the extrahepatic biliary remnants and the liver explants uh, for you know, uh, localization of these lesions, and a, a great team of gastroenterologists, radiologists, radiotechnologists that I work with. And hopefully uh, with this talk, you have gone from this to this uh, in terms of, um, you know, understanding BA and its mimics. Uh, happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Patel, for this uh, excellent discussion on uh, this very important topic that is biliary atasia and how uh, we can uh, differentiate from so many different mimics. Uh, I have seen a few questions online. So there was one question about uh, Alazil syndrome. So the question is about uh, what is a practical way to differentiate Alazil syndrome from other entities which might mimic because uh, not in all settings like where they practice. So they might have the facility to probably diagnose Alazil syndrome. So do you have any comment on that? Sure. And uh, it's a great question, actually. And, you know, it's very easy to come to a diagnosis when you have a lot of modalities at hand. Um, but in a limited resource setting, um, I would say uh, look at the age of the biopsy and age should really help. So um, if you have a early biopsy, um, at that point, allergen can truly mimic BA. And it is, I would say, you know, it, it, it's not a good idea to be very definitive um, a, 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 on an early biopsy uh, if you have a ductular reaction, you know, bile plugs. And so, you know, distal, distal histologic distal biliary obstruction on biopsy. At, and by early, I mean three to four months of age in a neonate, you know, you could have um, both allergy and BA. Um, what can help with allergil and BA is older. So if you get a biopsy that is uh, a child at three months or older, and you have no fibrosis on the biopsy at all, or very minimal fibrosis at three months or older, at that point, you can keep BA low on the differential. Um, and beyond three months, if the biopsy is from an older child, no fibrosis and duct loss, mm -hmm. at that point, you can at least bring in the possibility of an allergil. Um, and I mean, chest x-ray uh, should should be available, you know, even if you are in a, in a, I would say, a resource limited setting, chest x-ray, um, you know, is a very easy modality to look for butterfly vertebra. Um, ask your uh, gastroenterologist if they're worried about any dysmorphism in the face. And, you know, so with those helpful clues, um, you can uh, at least bring in that possibility. And, and I can understand if you, you know, uh, don't want to outright say allergil in your final diagnosis, you can at least top line your path report as saying, you know, by duct loss or duct paucity, see comment. And in the comment, you can say, you know, um, the biopsy shows uh, less than 50% portal tracts with, uh, uh, with a preserved bile duct. So, so or, in other words, more than 50% with absent ducts. And in the context of, you know, um, a, a, if you have butterfly vertebra, if there is any, if you don't have echocardiogram, maybe ask the pediatrician to hear the heart and, you know, you, maybe you will hear a murmur. Um, so uh, 
you know, pulmonary artery stenosis, even in the neonatal period should give, you know, you should hear a murmur. And so if there are any clinical concerns, you can write in your report um, that, that you suspect, you know, um, allergy should be ruled out or, you know, or bring in the possibility of an allergy. That thank you so long much. answer, uh, but hope it helps. Yeah. Uh, thank you. I think, I think this is very helpful. Uh, what I understood is uh, also that you suggested basically also to our viewers that it is a constellation of all the clinical findings that has to be taken into consideration. And even in a limited research setting, if uh, the entire clinical picture is taken into account, so maybe one can uh, uh, reach out to at least suggest allergy, right? Yeah, yeah, agree. Right. So, and there is another question uh, which is related about paucity of bile ducts, and uh, you mentioned about counting them. Uh, and uh, so, the question is about: Do you routinely use CK seven to properly, you know, be able to count uh, the bile ducts and the portal tracts? What is your experience on that? Great question again. And so, I would count bile ducts on HNE first because CK7 is going to highlight a lot of, if there is ductular reaction, a lot of ductular reaction is going to be highlighted by CK7, at which point it can become confusing uh, where the central duct in the portal tract could be absent and you would have ductular reaction. And, and if one of those ductules are big enough, you don't want to count that as the central duct. So start with h &E first and see what you get on h &E. uh, And again, focus on the ducts that are present in the center of the portal tract. So close to the arteries, close to the veins. Um, and if you're suspecting paucity on your h &E counts, then go to CK7 and confirm. Um, that would be the approach. But, um, you know, just jumping to CK7 um, can can be good. Well, if they are diffusely and you know completely absent, then that's a different story, and there is no ductular reaction at that point. CK seven can help, but in the context where the ducts are absent and you have ductular reaction in that very specific context, CK seven can be confusing. And so I would recommend starting with H and E and then move on to CK seven. I think this is a great answer, Dr. Patel, because uh, one might have a tendency to do CK7 and, you know, like be able to actually reliably, more reliably count uh, the bile ducts and the portal tracts. But as you said, that it might be misleading and one might actually take into consideration the bile ductular reaction, right? Not yes. the, not the, like not the actual duct. central duct. Yes. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah. That's, that's great to know. And, uh, because sometimes we might have resources and maybe like, you know, like we overuse them or overutilize them and yes. get into trouble. Right? Yes. Okay. Now that's great to know. And um, so on that same line, so there is a question. Oh, before that, I think let me read one comment from one of our viewers. So who is uh, watching from UK? So I, I will read it for you. Uh, so... Uh, Dr. Sujata Baliza, she wants to thank you and very grateful uh, that you are making her recollect the memories of dissecting several explant post kasai small dark green livers, uh, assisting Professor Barnard Portman at King's College London. Oh, wow. uh, so in the early years of heart training in UK. So maybe like, you know, I mean, uh, yeah, I thought I would read thank that. You. So uh, there is another question on that line uh, that you talked about the paucity of bile ducts. And the question is about uh, when you see bile ductular reaction, uh, how do you differentiate on a biopsy from a possible extrahepatic obstruction from uh, an, an internal cause or intrahepatic cause? I see. So, so when you see ductular reaction, so the question is, when you see ductular reaction, how do you differentiate from extrahepatic obstruction and intrahepatic cholestasis? And so we saw these three types of intrahepatic cholestasis, which are, you know, considered to be the most common. Among those three types, the only one that will have ductular reaction 
um, mimicking BA is P53. So, so, so that's important to remember. So for other two, which is PFIC1 and PFIC2, you're very, very less, I mean, very less likely to have ductular reaction in your portal tracts. They are more of lobular diseases and you're going to have findings in the lobules and the portal tracts are typically, uh, you know, I don't want to say uninvolved, but they don't have features that mimic me. So you can pretty much keep one and two low on the list of your differentials. Now with PFIC3, which definitely is a portal-based disease and can have ductular reaction, mm -hmm. but at the same time, it is essentially intrahepatic cholestasis. It's not extra. And so how do you differentiate between the two? Well, so what helps with that is the age. Um, as rare as this entity is, um, and so that's why we have not seen very many cases of PFI3, but we, you know, in over here, I think now I have seen at least four or five explants of PFI3. Uh, typically, it takes time for PFI3 to establish the full pathology. And so it would be very unusual for PFI3 to present with classic BA features. And what I mean is basically ductular reaction uh, in the neonatal period when BA is, you know, the diagnosis of BA is crucial. Mm -hmm. And so I would say, it, it, you know, luckily it's not a big conundrum um, for that. And uh, again, I mean, we are blessed here to have the immunohistochemical stain for P53. And so, you know, if you have it, do it if you don't have, I mean, you know, I, and I understand not many centers have that stain. In that case, then, then also keep in consideration your other radiologic and other findings. And so did the radiology see a small gallbladder or absent CBD? You know, was any HIDA or cholangiogram done before the biopsy? So maybe keep all those things in consideration. And at that point, you know, you should be able to reliably differentiate between, um, let's say, an intrahepatic cause with uh, ductular reaction versus ductular reaction secondary to BA. And at this point, I just want to um, make, you know, I don't want to forget in the last answer when somebody was asking about allergy and BA, one of the things that I should have mentioned is uh, aberrant staining of the hepatocytes by CK7 which is very classic in allergy um, and typically not seen in BAs. In BA, we see ductular reaction. So CK7 highlights this very, um, you, know, ab, you know, weirdly shaped, smaller sort of these ductules along the limiting plate in BA. But in allergy, what you will have is you will have absent bile duct in the portal tract and the hepatocytes that are surrounding the limiting plate, meaning zone one hepatocytes, they will show cytoplasmic staining by CK7, which is called aberrant hepatocellular staining by CK7, uh, pretty classically seen in allergy. So that can also help between the two. Thank you. Uh, so there is another question uh, about the interpretation of bile duct atresia. So this question is asking about uh, what happens when there is alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency? Is it a common uh, a pitfall in the diagnosis? Yeah, it's tricky. And so, so um, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency does give rise to a more um, uh, uh, like a thicker bile or, um, you know, biliary sludge or, or um, you know, a more viscous bile, uh, which can sort of... Uh, you know, I, I don't want to say obstruction, but, you know, it can give rise to stasis of bile in the extrahepatic uh, biliary tract and um, can mimic distal biliary obstruction um, on a biopsy in a neonatal period. Now, again, we are just uh, blessed here that many of these kids who undergo biopsy for BA also undergo pie typing. Um, and so we interpret the biopsies with that information at hand. You know, we know the pie typing of these patients and typical, you know, and so we know the status of whether it is ZZ or, or the regular, you know, MM or MZ uh, for alpha-9-trypsin. Um, 
PASD stain for identification of periportal globules is not very reliable for less than two months of age. Uh, the globules take time to develop. And so if you have a biopsy that is less than two months of age, you know, uh, you may not see those abnormal PSD positive globules. By three months of age, if you have a biopsy and you're trying to, you know, sort out this alpha and antitrypsin issue, um, by three months, you should typically see at least some globules, I would say, you know, um, they may not be the the most well-developed, you know, but they should be present by three months, at least in some portal tracts. Um, and then uh, sometimes with IOCs, meaning, in, you know, the intraoperative cholangiograms, um, especially with cystic fibrosis or alpha antitrypsin deficiency, the IOC is almost, we call it like a therapeutic IOC, where once you inject the dye into the gallbladder, this thick bile just drains and clears the jaundice, uh, that can happen. Um, and so one of the things to remember as a pathologist, when you are assessing a biopsy that comes to you with a question, rule out BA, the worst that you can do on a biopsy, and what I mean by that is, you know, you, you are calling something BA that is not BA, right? Like that would be the worst that you can do on a biopsy. So let's say you do that. You call something a BA or you say very, you know, like suggestive of BA or consistent with BA, whatever words you use. And you tell your uh, hepatologist that you think this could be BA. What essentially happens after that, at least in our setting here, is um, the child goes under anesthesia and the child undergoes an intraoperative cholangiogram after the biopsy. And during the intraoperative cholangiogram, they look at the draining of the dye, like I, you know, like we showed in those slides, into the duodenum or up into the liver. And at that point, if the dry the dye drains into the liver and up into the, you know, and into the duodenum, at that point they will abort the cassai and uh you know, the, the child will just be taken out of the OR. So what I'm trying to say is that the worst you can do by calling something BA is you will buy the child an unnecessary intraoperative cholangiogram. Um, so, so that's sort of like the, the cost benefit analysis that you have to do when you are reporting a biopsy where, okay, if you think uh, you're strongly suspicious of BA, talk to your gastroenterologist and say, hey, I do think that there are features of distal biliary obstruction. However, you know, when you put the child in an anesthesia, why don't you do an IOC? And we can make the decision to do a porto introstomy after that. Um, and that approach has sort of worked in our institution. We do have, um, you know, I have to say, we have at least a few examples where um, we said we cannot rule out BA. There are some features of distal biliary obstruction. Um, we think this could be BA, but we are not sure, right? So that happens, and we have said that. And then the child was put, put under anesthesia, intraoperative cholangiogram happened, and the dye drained. And at that point, they aborted the cassai, and uh, you know the jaundice was relieved um, in in a few weeks. Um, yeah. Thank you again, Dr. Patel. And I think one last question that I see is that you talked about uh, adequate number of bile duct and also the A's at biopsy. And uh, the question is about if you have less number of by portal tracts. Sorry, if you have less number of or like inadequate number of portal tracts on a biopsy and uh, what do you do? That is question number one. And second is if the child is uh, like, if the biopsy is taken at an early age, so is, does it have an influence on making a diagnosis? Both did, thank you. Yeah, yeah both are extremely difficult situations. And personally, at this point, I would actually recommend not doing biopsies for less than 15 days of age. I think that is just too early um, because now you're putting the pathologist in a position where the classic features of BA are, have not had the time to develop on the biopsy, you know? Um, and 
so the biopsy often could be just equivocal. You can't be very definitive on very early biopsies where there are no features to, you know, diagnose BA. And the benefit, so, you know, one would argue, uh, you know, early CASA is important. So early biopsy is important, right? But I do think the the, the benefit of an early CASA, you know, if you do between 30 to 45 days of age is not very different from if you do the biopsy at less than 15 days of age. Now, I think, I, I mean, I really think less than 15 days of uh, age biopsies just don't help anybody. You know, um, th having said that, 15 to 30 days of uh, biopsies at that age, they are the most difficult because as such, you are not very early. You know, you've had two weeks for the child and but you're still in the very, you know, in, in the early phase of DA. And so you have some findings, you know, it could be the early some features. You, you may have one bile plug among all of the portal tracts and all of that. And what I have seen in our practice, at least, is in those biopsies that are done um, at 15 to 30 days of age, you know, we have typically understanding that this is an early biopsy, we have lowered our threshold for calling something a BA. So we have calibrated our threshold. We then don't wait for all of the features to be seen, all, you know, all the, the fibrosis to be set in and whatnot. So we have recalibrated our threshold. And the real answer to how to diagnose BA on these early, and by early, I mean 30, 15 to 30 days biopsy is just looking at more and more and more. Um, the more biopsies you look at, you know, these younger patients, you will have a new calibration for your BA uh, diagnosis and you will kind of go from there. Um, the, the second portion of the question was about the portal tracts, adequacy of the portal tracts. I mean, I think six is real minimum. If you have anything less than six, uh, just it's 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 not worth it, you, you know saying one thing one way or the other. I mean, very unless I mean you know in a very older child, let's say you have a biopsy more than forty five days of age, and you just have five portal tracts, but you have well established fibrosis, bile you know bile plugs, ductular reaction. At that point, okay, you know yes, you're you it's a limited biopsy, but you have all the findings, so go for it. You know, you can say features of distal biliary obstruction seen, you know, most consistent with BA. Um, but if you have a early biopsy with less number of portal tracts, um, again, eight to 10 is ideal. Six to eight, you are really now working with a limited biopsy and less than six is um, suboptimal, um, you know. So it, 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 you don't, you're not making anybody happy it's a, but you also don't want to, uh, you know, give out a wrong diagnosis on a limited biopsy. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Patel. Uh, I think we have come to the end of the Q&A session. And uh, if our viewers have any questions for Dr. Patel on this entity, and as you can see on the screen that uh, the, her uh, email is there, so you can directly reach out to Dr. Patel on her email address, and she would be more than happy to answer your questions. And if you prefer to reach out to us, we would also be happy to forward your question to Dr. Patel. And uh, thank you again, Dr. Patel, for this excellent talk. And uh, thanks to our viewers who watched the talk far as far from Syria, Pakistan, Bahrain, India, Philippines, UK, Serbia, that I could keep track of, and uh, at Patcast and as pathology community in general. So our um, we empathize with our colleagues who are watching or who watch our lectures in Syria or Turkey. So uh, hope you all are staying safe and definitely um, we all can help each other at this difficult time. And we thank our viewers for your support to Patcast. And if you like our lecture, so please don't follow, don't forget to subscribe our YouTube channel that is Patcast and also follow the Facebook page. And you can also visit our 
web page that is pathologycast.com so that you can stay updated with the upcoming lectures and our next lecture is a talk on pulmonary pathology so that would be on february 28th and our speaker will be dr yasmin butt who is a pathologist at uh, mayo clinic arizona so hope to see you then and thank you again uh, dr patel for your time and this excellent talk thanks a lot thank you dr manan thank you